episode touches on themes of suicide, sexual violence, and violence that may be triggering to some individuals. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is your sister and friend Adar, and you're listening to the Digital Sisterhood Podcast. Before we really get into this episode, it's important to note that we recorded the following interviews at different times. We first spoke to our guest Yusra in December 2023, and then again in March 2024. May Allah keep her safe and reward her for her work. Amin. On April 15, 2023, during the last 10 days of the blessed month of Ramadan, a war broke out in the northeast African country of Sudan. As of February 2024, 8 million people have been displaced, 25 people are in need of aid, and thousands have tragically lost their lives. We have heard many times that there are different sides to the story in Sudan, and that it makes the situation difficult to understand. So today, we are bringing you the stories of the people, those souls who have been the most affected by the tragedy, and those who continue to be affected today as the war rages on. We've seen all of the iconic images of the Sudanese sister during the 2019 revolutions. You know the one, she's dressed all in white, standing strong and powerful on top of a car with her fists in the air and surrounded by a rallying crowd. This image is one that has come to represent the loud resilience of the Sudanese women throughout its history. It is one that comes to mind today as I welcome with admiration and respect another iconic and powerful voice. This sister that has bravely reported on stories around the world from Sudan to Rwanda, to Palestine, to France, and more. This is a sister who's making sure that we hear the stories of the people live and on the ground in its most true and pure form. Today, I welcome the Yusra al a celebrated journalist who has been working tirelessly to spotlight the atrocities taking place in her beloved homeland of Sudan. But before we dive in, I'll let Yusra introduce herself. Well, in the beginning, there was the word. <laughs> and the word was Khartoum. So I was born in Khartoum and my parents uh, were in exile. It was after uh, Omar al-Bashir took over in a coup in 1989, took over Sudan. So my dad and other uh, members of political opposition, he was a democratic unionist. He still is. So he'd say that he still is to the, to the blood, to the core. But at the time they were really organizing and he had a newspaper that started in 1988 and it's a political broadsheet called Al Khartoum. And they left as soon as they could see. It was after a short stint of democracy from 1986 and the tides changed. It was a very short lived moment. And my dad went to the UK to do his PhD. My parents refused to seek asylum very proud Sudanese <laughs> refusing to give up their passport. I mean, it was very, made things difficult for us, but I can definitely understand handing over your passport for refuge is a difficult choice. So my dad went as a student and my mom could not give birth out of Sudan. Even if there's a passport involved, she just can't do it. So all of us, for all of us, she'd go back to Khartoum, except my brother who was born in Cairo, my eldest brother, um, She'd go back to Khartoum and the three sisters were all born in Khartoum. So born in Riyadh, Khartoum. And then when I was six months, I met, I met my dad for the first time in exile in Cairo. And then from there we went to the UK. And every summer, every Christmas was spent in Sudan. So months, like at least three, four months of the year we were in Sudan. So even though we were in the UK till I was eight, my parents did everything they could and my mom at least to the to the core like we were only allowed to speak Arabic at home so if you ask for food and you're like mom I'm hungry she'd be like what <laughs> <laughs> then you're like mom and a then she'd be like Khalas, like it was just this don't ever lose sight of where you're from constantly and for better or for worse 
And I would see my mom when she was in the UK, she was just low. Like she was longing in a constant state of longing in a constant state of worry, always talking to my uncles and my grandma uh, back in Sudan. My life has been a series of culture shocks for sure. It felt like that crash landing to the UK and then we crash land in Sudan and it's, they're just so distinctly different. Like you go from this very temperate island, you know, this is like built up industrialized like island that is, does not seem like an island at all. And then you go to Sudan and it's like, you're in the desert, bruv, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yep. you're in a city, the most populated city in the Sahel. You're in a place where my, like migrants going to Hajj pass through from West Africa. Mm. You're where, you know, traders, where there's just been so much movement. But it was during a time in the 90s where there was a civil war. The second civil war was going on and it was just this bubble of delusion, like the idea that the war was far away. I mean, there was a lot of, it was just this real political stalemate. It was very parched. And this was before the genocide in Darfur started in the early 2000s. Let's take a pause here to look at a bit of contextual history. The genocide that Yusuf refers to began in 2003, after a rebellion had broken out in the western region of Darfur. The rebellion wanted a greater autonomy from Khartoum. But already in Sudan, since 1956, there had been an ongoing civil war due to rebels in the south also wanting greater autonomy from Khartoum-based rule. The rebellion that erupted in the west in 2003 did not claim allegiance with those in the south, but the groups... They had similar objectives. Now, the response of the Sunnis government to the 2003 rebellion was brutal. When I tell you brutal, it was absolutely brutal. <laughs> President Omar al-Bashir ordered a scorched earth campaign against civilians in the region. For those who might not know what scorch earth policy is, it's basically synonymous with complete destruction. Complete destruction. It is a military strategy of destroying infrastructure, water, food, animal, buildings. I mean, everything it takes for a group to be able to fight back. Or in this case, for civilians to survive. With that knowledge, let's return to use of story. That's when I was there for school. And when I was there for school in 2001, 2002, as an eight-year-old, we went to a British Unity High School. It used to be like a Christian missionary school. My grandma went there. Like, it's just a, from 1902, has very like colonial heritage. Um, it's kids, all of these kids of like people who were in exile who wanted to come back. There was a big wave in 2001, 2002, where people just went back to Sudan. Bashir actually actively invited journalists back and my parents went back to start the newspaper there at the start of like the Darfur conflict. And it was really interesting because we were never, I remember when 9-11 happened, we were called to an assembly. I was in year six and they were like, the worst thing in the world has happened. And we were like, oh my gosh, this is so bad. And of course it was horrible, it was horrendous. It was 2000 people. But it was like, meanwhile, you know, tens of thousands of people were dying to the west of the country and they weren't even allowed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. They weren't allowed to teach us about it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was interesting because the life at home was very politically charged. My sister was covering Darfur as a young journalist. My parents were dealing with all sorts of political issues, all sorts of economic issues with the newspaper, but also my siblings always had people around. Like there was a, a real push for a new Sudan, especially with their Southern Sudanese friends. So they would all gather around. And so it was very active at home, very political at home. And then very, as soon as you step out of the house, it just felt like no one's really... There's no public expression, you know, there are no protests, there's no organizing and everything was happening, definitely happening, but I couldn't see it in a, like a consumable way, 
you know, where you go to school and people are like, that this war is happening in the West or the, the civil war happened with the South. It's the longest civil war in Africa. Like basic facts weren't taught to us. We were learning the British curriculum in Africa. Too often, too often, the first time we really picture a place, particularly in a non-Western world, is when we hear about it after tragedy strikes. That means our associations with a lot of the really magnificent places are overwhelmed with images of war and poverty. Now, we must not forget the cultural richness, the natural beauty, the life of the people of these lands. The lands are mostly inhibited by our Muslim brothers and sisters. Now, Sudan wears many scars, but what of the beautiful bodies that behold those scars? What does it mean to be Sudanese? We love to sing, dance, <laughs> eat, and crack jokes. I mean, this is the thing that makes this so hard, is that you really feel like people were introduced to us with the revolution, reintroduced to us with the revolution. They heard our rhythms, they heard the sounds of, of, of our resistance, but they also saw how we, the fearlessness and the ability to even make jokes mm -hmm. through that through those difficulties like there's a liveliness there's um an expression of who we are that is even in just the way that we like quip and <laughs> our comebacks are like <laughs> just insane but also it's there everything is is a party if we're doing it together no there's literally iris. so it's a sudanese proverb iris is that um, collective death is is a wedding like if we're all riding together if we're doing something <sighs> together it's it's fine like we're mm -hmm. good then we're gonna ride together uh, like as long as we're, we're together. gonna ride together we yeah. ride at dawn man when i remember some of the images that came out um and the first time we're being actually uh, you're right uh reintroduced to sudan was the images of the women standing against the fight and i never in my entire life as I've known more from school, outside, have I ever seen a woman draped in her clothing looking, might, might I add, beautiful. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, she's not, she, doesn't, she doesn't look roughed up, okay? She doesn't look like she came out of the gutter. Like, it was like she looked like a swan, in my opinion. And <laughs> yeah. she's standing in front of the people. And she's 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 singing the song and she's and by the way, which became revolutionary. People yeah, used yeah. to people played that like uh, melodic song yeah. at weddings. Uh, I was thinking yeah. like I, it's like it was a celebration of that moment yeah. and the celebration yeah. of the uh, of the people of Sudan. And so it really changed the framework of of women's participation. But first, a quick message from our sponsors, and then we'll be back to continue this story. We at TDS stand firm in our commitment to fight for our ummah. This Ramadan, as we weave stories of unwavering faith, let us take a moment to turn our hearts to those engaged in daily struggle for survival. The resilient Palestinian people. Every time I reflect on their trial, I am reminded of this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. We will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and fruits. But give good tidings to the patient who, when disaster strikes them, say, Indeed, we belong to Allah, and indeed to him we will turn. Because to me, the Palestinian people, amidst the trials of war and displacement, epitomize this unwavering faith, knowing full well that they will indeed return to their Lord. This Ramadan, let us make a difference in the lives of our Palestinian brothers and sisters. Help us in ensuring dedicated emergency relief for good distribution, winter provisions, and Ramadan food boxes can reach them and alleviate some small semblance of their suffering by visiting www.launchgood.com forward slash TDS, the number four, Palestine. That's www.launchgood.com forward slash TDS, Four, like the number four, Palestine. And remember, as we share stories of fighting for faith this season, let our actions reflect the strength of our faith and that of our ummah. Because together, we can be a source of hope, 
solace, and resilience for the Palestinian people. Again, head to launchgood.com forward slash TDS for Palestine, donate, and fight. In order to understand the revolution, I mean really understand the revolution that took place in 2018 and the current war in Sudan, we need to understand the country's recent history. So Yusra, God bless her, gave us a detailed breakdown. So Omar al-Bashir is a military dictator who comes into power in 1989 through a military coup. He is an Islamist and he is, by all measures, an Arab supremacist. He is very much wanting to orient Sudan towards the Gulf and Arab world. And in the meantime, in doing that, consistently sold out the country, whether it was through corrupt 99-year leases to Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, whether it was constantly kind of pandering to Arab leaders. He made Sudan's dictatorship or lack of democracy currency for him to appease these powers regionally in the Arab world. So this kind of building of an Arab Sudanese state created, in my opinion, the seeds for the Darfur genocide and the foundation for what we're seeing today. When Darfur it has native authorities that the British distributed, land that was distributed for four tribes, non-Arab Sudanese tribes in the West that were part of the Funj Sultanate who have had power in Sudan for over centuries, actually. So they are not new to having power and land in Sudan and are a Muslim sultanate, so they were not enslaved. What happened was that Arab nomadic tribes coming in from the Sahel, Rizagat, Misariya, Himiti's tribe is the Rizagat, the RSF commander now. They were very much disenfranchised in Darfur. When the four tribes, the Darfuri tribes, started to rebel against Umar al-Bashir's Arab governance that excluded non-Arab tribes from central power, what did he do? He went and armed the Rizagat, the Miseria, the Baggara, herders, nomadic Arab herders in the western states of Darfur, he armed them on the basis of their Arabness. And I know this to be fact because one of them told me that al-Bashir armed us because we are Arab. That was the basis in which he told them, I am giving you power to crush these guys. That is what happened in the early 2000s in Darfur, where they were raising these tribes who became called the Janjaweed. That's a four translation in English is devils on horseback. They would ride into Darfuri villages. They would raise it to the ground. They would loot houses. They would pillage. It was a mass extermination campaign that saw tens of thousands of people killed. Fast forward to 2011. There have been peace agreements. The violence has quelled after much loss after decades of civil war, South Sudan split. Sudan's oil revenue was completely stripped. The oil was mostly in the South. The infrastructure was in the North. That completely debilitated al-Bashir because he suddenly lost his source of leverage and capital. And one of his closest advisors, who turned against him after the protests, said that the loss of South Sudan is when al-Bashir started to become more and more insane, like lost his sense of reason, though many would argue he wasn't reasonable in the first place. But that's when his closest advisors noticed the difference in his behavior. But economically, Sudan started to really flounder. Like that was when economically the oil revenues fell away and all the kind of non-oil parts of the Sudanese portfolio agriculture was trying to catch up, but there was not enough investment in agriculture that it did come, but it was not enough to economically sustain the country. So there started to be a gradual subsidy lift where the government started to lift fuel subsidies. So petrol suddenly became more expensive, which meant food became suddenly more expensive, which meant that the Sudanese middle class was suddenly impacted 
economically in central Sudan in a way that they had never been before. They suddenly felt the impact of the wars that were happening in Darfur and South Sudan on their plate. Because being from Khartoum, you would never really feel you could go your whole life not knowing there was a conflict in Darfur or in the South Sudan. You just could go because it didn't impact you personally. So there was a lot of denialism around the atrocities being committed by the Sudanese army and affiliated militias in Darfur and in South Sudan. So there started to be waves of protests just from people that were dissatisfied. There was always a political left who was against these wars, who was against the violence of the Sudanese state. But it started to spread because people were starting to really feel the corruption of the political class in Sudan. So 2013, there were mass protests, probably the strongest that the country had seen uh, in, in sort of the 2000s. And, you know, the numbers are really difficult to verify, but human rights agencies say it was around 200 students were killed in a matter of days from protests happening. So that really crushed the movement. And then in 20, 16 students rose up again in protests and there were extrajudicial arrests and torture and abductions by the Sydney security state that also, again, things had to kind of quieten down. In 2019, it was just, nope, we cannot do this. I remember in 2016 interviewing people and them saying, we used to send our kids with two sandwiches to school and now we can only send them with like one sandwich. By 2019, kids were going to school with barely any food. People were working incredibly hard and making wages that they could not live off of. There was absolute discontent on a national scale. And that's where you saw a revolution that was just, we have had enough, this must end. Even the slogan, Tazgut bis, just fall. This regime needs to just fall. But Tazgut means fall, fail, you know, completely collapse. It needs to end. It was beautiful. It was mobilized by women, by doctors, by, you know, civil society, by people from all walks of life. And it was happening all over the country. I go to Kassala this time, I see graffiti from the revolution. I go to Port Sudan, I see graffiti from the revolution in the army compound. This is, this was something that was completely just collective on every level. Everyone was fed up. The person who was apathetic, was now empathetic. The person who was unmoved was now moved. It was just collective action on a national scale. And we were proud to share this with the world. I personally, as a journalist, was proud to show us in this light of empowering sacrifice. And I will never, ever forget the days that I spent covering the revolution. They shaped the person that I am and will be in the years of my life that that come, inshallah. Eventually, Bashir is removed, but he's not removed by revolutionaries in like, they don't suddenly turn into revolutionaries, though the protest mobilized this coup because they knew that he had no future in the country because of how people were moved against him. The president was removed by Hamiti, the head of the RSF, and by the now head of the army, Burhan, and a few others who sat in the presidential palace in the Republican palace and said, this guy needs to go. But the vacuum was theirs. They wanted to fill the vacuum. And that was very clear. So suddenly after the revolution, Hamiti was suddenly de facto VP of the country, meeting ambassadors, meeting the head of the EU, meeting the US envoy, meeting the British ambassador. And Burhan, the head of the army, they were, they were just pairs. They were together. They were planning to run this country, but they made a series of concessions to civilian politicians, opposition politicians who said, no, people are calling for civilian rule. We can mobilize the people to protest against you at any moment until you guys give us the concessions. A a power sharing agreement was made in, in August, 2019. And over the next period of the transition, the army would be in control. And then the second half of the transition, civilian politicians would be in control. Those concessions that those civilian politicians made at a table with Hamiti and Burhan never wrought any benefit because as it came close to civilians taking over, Burhan and Hamiti have a coup on October 25th, 2021. And then again, close to them saying they're going to sign a power sharing agreement and they're going to cede power, what happens? They have a lover's quarrel and they decide that they are not 
in agreement because the army wants the RSF, Hamiti's forces, to be absorbed. It's the second largest armed faction in the country outside of the army. They want them to be absorbed into the army. And Hamiti is like, absolutely not. This is my money-making militia that has been used by the EU to monitor migration on the borders, has been used by the UAE and Saudi and Yemen, has been propped up by all these entities and actors who are willing to pay a militia to enact their interests with Sudan as a corridor from the continent to to other parts of the world. On April 15, 2023, Al-Burhan and Hamidi's partnership comes to an explosive end. And in the months that, f- that have followed, armed violence has killed thousands of people. Hamidi's forces have occupied people's homes in the capital, in Darfur, in Madani, in central Sudan, in, in Al Jazeera's food basket state. The RSF have abducted women, children, have recruited children, have killed people just on sight. The stories you hear of someone's just father or uncle just being shot in the head because he stood in their way or looked at them a certain type of way, just extrajudicial killings on a mass scale. And the army's airstrikes have killed civilians in the capital and in Darfur on a on a very large scale. I wouldn't say their um, violence has killed as many people as the RSF, but their state has killed as many people as the RSF. The military state has led to this point. So the army is responsible for the RSF because Umar al-Bashir's military state created the RSF. And the army trained the RSF in 2018 and 2017 in the Blue Nile state and in South Kurdufan and West Kurdufan, again, non-Arab regions where they could enact impunity and they could teach them how to do what they are doing to the Sudanese people now. So in my opinion, there are no heroes in this war. Even if the army defeats the RSF, they are still responsible for what's happened. And the only heroes are the civilian volunteers on the ground, the, the, the community efforts that are being carried out by, by civilians, by people, by former activists, like revolutionary activists who have these resistance committees, who have these neighborhood committees. These are the only heroes. They are doing the work of the state. The people of Sudan are the only heroes in this war. There is no warring faction that will ever liberate this country. Amidst terrifying countrywide blackouts, we have been able to speak to Omnia, a 21-year-old woman who is currently trying to flee Sudan. Now, she's been on the move for a few weeks now, but unfortunately, she has not been able to find safety yet. We are contacting her through WhatsApp voice notes, and she replies to us in intervals whenever she feels safe or has cover or when telecommunications are restored. Because access is very unreliable, and we are constantly, like, constantly and consistently concerned for her well-being. So please, keep Abnia in your dress. I personally, I'm just going to talk about myself from now on, on, woke up on April 15th at 5 p.m. Because I stayed up all night uh, watching K-Drama, <laughs> and it's Ramadan, so we just, you know, sleep all day and stay up all night. So I wake up at 5 p.m. and I open my phone and I see 100 calls from different friends. And I'm like, oh my God, who died? So I call my best friend and he answers me yelling and screaming into the phone, asking me where I was. And I was like, hello, where are you? What's happening? Like, why didn't you pick up? We thought you died. Are you okay? And I'm like, wait a minute what's going on I was like what do you mean what's going on there's a whole war outside I'm like what do you mean a war you're lying it's like no I'm not just check the tv so I go into the living room and I see my mom laying down I ask her mom Mohammed is saying there's a war like is that is there such a thing and she's like she laughs and she says yeah and because she laughed I assume it's there's nothing like that so I'm like oh you both are lying to me haha <laughs> and then he's like check the TV. And I open the TV, but there is nothing, like no signal. So, and then he's like, okay, check your internet. I'm like, all right. So I hang up and I open Instagram.
First thing I see is the video of a fighter jet flying over Khartoum and launching a rocket. And I'm like, is this happening in real life? Like I was in so much disbelief. I cannot even like stress it enough how much denial I was in. And then I scroll to the other video and I see video of Sudanese people in the airport traveling, but all laying down and taking shelter as like someone is shooting. And I'm like, wow, so it is happening. And then I'm like, ah, in the back of my head, I'm like, ah, we've been through many things like this. It's probably not a big deal. And then I see more and more videos of bombs, mass shootings, shelling, a lot of things. And just like as a reality just kicked in, I start to hear those sounds around me. Like I pay more attention to my surroundings and I start to hear the sound of shelling the sound of bombing but it's a bit far from us so i'm like okay so it's happening (laughs) like the thought is settling in that this is happening and then i obviously check all my loved ones and they all say oh yeah it's happening we hear it like some of my friends were in danger zones like where everything was happening around them and i would say my house was located in a neighborhood that's between four or five military bases So when it was nighttime, I walk outside and I see the sky lightning with rockets flying from every direction. And I'm like, okay, this has happened. It's happening. Oh my God. And then... The same night, some of those rockets, they fall into houses close to us and we could hear the impact, like the house shaking, windows opening, glass shattering, like it was a really rough experience. And I would say after like a week, my parents are like, all right, enough of this. We cannot take it anymore. We need to leave. It doesn't seem like it's ending now, but it's okay. It might end in a week or two because that's what the army was saying. So I just pack up my bag. I take two pajamas, um, literally two sets of underwear, and three books. And I put them in my backpack, and I take my laptop, and I leave everything else at my home. And I'm just like, yeah, it's going to be a week or two, you know. Uh, Things like this happen a lot around here, so I'm not really concerned. And then I go, and this week turns into nine months (laughs) nine months and the capital is destroyed 80 percent of the infrastructure is gone 90 percent of the houses are looted and robbed and my house like the last update we got from my house was that they were taking off the fans of the ceiling to rob them so they took everything i think so the fighting broke between the Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support militia and those people are those people are not humans they are horrid monsters i'm talking about the RSF they've done everything from raping to killing to detaining to butchering to kidnapping to selling women in markets The situation on ground, as someone who was there, I could see them shooting at people. They came to our house in the village when uh, we left with the two cars we had, because two of of our cars were robbed, uh, looted in Khartoum. So we only had two other cars and we used them to go to the village. They came to our house, knocked on the door, said, give us the keys. And obviously we did. And we were very scared that they would ask for other things like for women or for money or for whatever they please. So we were very relieved that they just took the car and left. And they visited us many, many times afterwards. And each time it never got less scary or less terrifying of what they could possibly ask for. I think Uh, based on a lot of eyewitness a lot of people have been violated by them and killed and 
they have also they are also committing um genocide right now in the west of Sudan. They're killing African tribes and they're driven by Arab supremacy. So that's all I can say about what I have personally seen on ground. And each city that got invaded is now lifeless. Like when you walk through the city, you just see flipped cars, abandoned homes, destroyed buildings, mass graves with the neighborhoods as people are not allowed to bury their loved ones. They're not allowed to bury the dead. You just see ghost cities, banks are robbed, hospitals are not working, factories are burnt down, markets are burnt down. Like so much destruction, so much devastation for no apparent reason. Like, I guess that's just how wars are. There are no reasons for wars. They're just destruction, destructive Honestly, I, I I don't know. Like most of the time, I've been numb. Like I would say, all this time I've just been numb, like in a state of disbelief and denial. Like it just never resonated. Like that this, all of this is happening. Like my world just crumbled. You know, like everything I knew was taken away from me, and I'm homeless and you know, helpless. Even though. Before all of that, I was I had been really successful. Like I had just graduated uni with the highest GPA in my batch, and I was interning at my dream job. So life was going well, and we've never struggled financially. Alhamdulillah. So for everything to be taken away from me like that in a split of a second, I don't think it ever sat with me until now. But yeah, we've been like I I would say being Muslim kinda helps me like you just you know that everything is going according to a plan and God is not merciless; He is merciful, and all this suffering we're going through right now is going to be rewarded in the afterlife. And that, uh, and I'm also I think one thing that's keeping me sane is that the most valuable things in my life are still there, like my family. And my loved ones and my friends, I'm so glad I haven't lost anyone so far. So that is something that just keeps me grateful. And also the fact that I still have a roof over my head and I have food on the table. It's a lot. Like it's it's something that many Sudanese people don't have at this moment. So yeah, that, that keeps me grounded. I also like to read a lot. So I've been just burying myself in books and music and just talking to people online and activism as well. It makes me feel like I'm doing something for my people and to like alleviate, like to, you know, just lessen the suffering. I've seen a lot of kindness from Sudanese people. I have, like, the people that hosted us, the night that we spent, we, w- we were literally going to sleep on the floor in the middle of nowhere. But the village people have been very kind to host us and we have no relation to them. It just makes me realize how kind my people are. Like, they're really kind. And seeing all these initiatives being held by Sudanese youth, seeing them you know, organizing, raising funds for people. And some of them are even like volunteering in in conflict zones. Some of them are delivering food, delivering farm, like uh, medicine to the people who cannot leave their houses in the middle of a battle zone, in the middle of a war zone. So just seeing the goodness, like the kindness of the Sudanese people always makes me hold on like it, it makes me strong it makes me believe that there might be a better future for us there might be something out there for us so yeah as long as they exist i will exist and as long as we all exist we can make a better future for sudan for our children to live in we will make a better future we will make a peaceful future for Sudan and we're going to rebuild everything from the scratch like that's not even like 
a hope or an ambition. This is a belief. So Yusra returned to Sudan at the end of February. And on the ground, she's reporting tirelessly on the heartbreaking realities and interviewed those hit the hardest by the atrocities. I'm talking orphans, those who are disabled, pregnant women. She reported on the surges of ethnic killings, horrific cases of rape and brutal sieges. In one article, Yusra reports on the scale of rape as unthinkable. A lot of us have seen images of women taking up arms in Sudan. And on one level, we're motivated by those images. But we have to understand that a lot of these women are mothers and grandmothers even. They are having to pick up weapons out of necessity. They are having to defend themselves, their families, their daughters against the unthinkable. They are training in places where their children once studied and played. I'm talking about playgrounds transformed into training grounds for women and girls. That is insane. This is what Yusra witnessed upon her return to Sudan. She was faced with the unending collective grief of her people. So when we first went to Sudan, it was 10 days into the war. It was mass shock, disbelief, real uncertainty, but still a very visceral level of shock where people had not been able to understand or acknowledge what was happening. And a lot of hope, or at least wishful thinking, that it would be resolved within a couple of weeks at most. Going back 10 months in, the amount of grief that we felt from people, most people we would speak to would just collapse into tears. And the first interviews we had with people, it was just sheer grief. I think being away from it, it becomes conceptual, but in the most terrifying way, where you get the worst of it, where you hear the the rape and you hear about the mass looting. And obviously our own homes have been taken over and our own homes have been looted. But when you meet someone and you look them in the eye and they are completely bereft over all that they've lost and all that they've experienced, it really does feel real for the first time. We went to a hospital in Port Sudan, a civilian hospital, and we go into the room and I ask like who in this ward is, has been displaced because obviously Port Sudan is a hub and this old man is in the corner and initially he's silent. And we do one interview with one man who is actually too sick to really express himself. And obviously in those moments, we just move on because we don't want people to be, you know, to strain themselves when they're already ill to speak to us. So I go to this man and he's sitting up and the man is around like 60, 65. He's an elderly man and he's sitting up against the bed. And before he even speaks, his lips tremble. And he just says, They took everything. They took everything. And he just starts listing all the things that they stole from him. They took my air conditioner. They took my washing machines. They took my cupboards. They took my tuk-tuk. Everything they took. Alhamdulillah. And the tears running down his face as he says this. And though we have heard a lot of gory stories, this man just touched me because I could see that he'd worked so hard to get the washing machine, to get the fridge, to get the cupboards, to get the air conditioners that he had worked his whole life and was clearly from a working class background. And he was completely robbed of everything that he'd built his life to provide for his family. And in a moment, just the level of violation and that he just has nothing, nothing. And just the, the, the inhumanity of it, the brutality of it, but the fact that this is not some sort of redistribution of wealth, social justice, take from the rich, give to the poor. This is not that. This is pillaging people who already have very little and who have worked extremely hard for the little that they have. There was just something about this man who was 
honestly, the only word I can use is bereft. That just, I don't think will ever leave me. When we hear these atrocities, this extreme violence that's unimaginable to many of us, it can be easy to fall into despair. I mean, just listening to this makes me fall into despair. I want to lose hope in the mercy of Allah by just the facts. But we have to remember that it's our duty to rise above that despair, to utilize the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with in order to bring about change. Everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has a gift they are able to share with the world. For Yusra, that gift is being a messenger of truth, a transmitter of real-life experiences of people around the world. Let's return back to Yusra to learn about how she uses her gift to make change. I feel like my purpose, at least for now, is to transmit a message in its purest form where people can watch or read what I've written about something or an event or what we filmed and feel like they've gotten as close to it as possible, to the heart of it. And I think in that sense, and I do really like using Asma Allah al-Husna to kind of meditate on a certain attribute and be like, okay, what I should be focusing on. But I think al-haq, the truth, really, I keep coming back to that. And I think it's like, Truth with a capital T in the sense of, I think people take journalism as like, yeah, fact checking, fact checking. And I think it's a hundred percent a primary skill in journalism. You can't be talking. And most importantly, everyone's going to make mistakes. I think what I've learned is you have to correct. You have to amend the record. You have to be humble enough to say, oh, that was incorrect. I need to fix that. So there's that truth, kind of the fundamental like reality truth. But there's the truth of the experience, There's the truth of how this person was feeling and the reality of the situation. And that needs context. And it needs a sense of there's something that needs to travel. There's something that needs to land. And I think this is where it's so much about humanizing, universalizing, transmitting the actual feeling that someone is having, as opposed to making them a number or making it an empty, and then this happened, and then that happened, and then this happened. And then, and that can manifest in ways where it's investigative journalism, and the truth with a capital T is like evidence of intense political corruption. And I think there are plenty of journalists that do that brilliantly. I think for me, that's what I feel like right now I need to do, is to go to the place, meet the people experiencing the the event, the thing, the product of the hist- the historical processes, understand what the underlying vibration is, and then finding a way to transmit that through facts, but through how the space, I don't want to say how I, lo- I allow them, but the space that we give them to express themselves. And having that awareness that everything I'm doing should be meaningful and is meaningful and and needs to be dealt with, with that responsibility and that sense of like thoroughness is, is really important because I have to stand by everything that I say. That's how I feel about it. I don't feel like fact checking is so you don't get in trouble. You fact check because you want to adequately like deliver the message. It's almost like, you know, we have that sense of the envoy is so important. The person who takes the letter from one place to the next But there needs to be the sanctity of that needs to be protected. And so I feel like when someone speaks to me about what's happened to them, my job is to protect that message and deliver it in a way that really translates. And they shouldn't even have to worry about how that happens. I need to bring that out and I need to help them feel comfortable. I really try my best. And it's hard because I'm biased and I'm attached and I love Sudan and Sudan is in my blood But I really try to bring the love and care that I have for Sudan to every country that I have the privilege of covering. I really feel like that's the only way to humanize and to share in a meaningful way, but also respect people's communities and respect people's cultures and to understand that what they're going through is no less or no less significant than what I'm going through. It's just a different manifestation. It's just a different way that power is playing out. And 
it happens across the board. Like I went to Brazil and we were making a documentary about the sort of rise of the Black Lives Matter like movement. But this is after George Floyd and it's not BLM Brazil. It's Movimento Negro, which is from the 80s, which is the original like Brazilian civil rights movement. So we we went there and we spoke to mothers whose like 14-year-old son, Jao Pedro, was shot by the police. And I think that year in 2020, I'd spoken to three mothers in that year alone who'd lost a child and they were from different countries. Um, so it was Brazil, it was Denmark, a Tanzanian woman who lost her son who was killed by these white uh, supremacists and a Sudanese woman who'd lost her son in the revolution. And the realization that the grief is the same, the loss is the same, and the context is different, but fundamentally it's that brutality, it's that inhumanity, it's that sense that one life means more than another And I think that is the fundamental global universal issue that we're all facing. And you can't really be of service and be picking and choosing whose struggle is more important. We are immensely blessed to have heard from Yusra and Omnia, two extremely brave women, about what is currently happening in Sudan and to the Sudanese people. This episode has barely, I'm going to be honest, has barely scratched the surface on the war. We are bringing you these stories because we want you to do more than just listen. We want you to take action and fight alongside us to help our brothers and sisters in Sudan. So what can you do? Well, to start, please read the episode's description that includes some key resources on organizations you can donate to, sources to learn from about Sudan, and key accounts to follow on social media. In the best of all months, please, please make countless du'a for the people of Sudan. Ask Allah relentlessly to rectify their affairs as he truly knows best. And don't lose hope. Use the many gifts Allah has blessed you with to use to make a difference to bring people together. You can do this. We can do this. There are fundraisers that are out there. I think those fundraisers are being shared consistently. Um, Sad al Hassan, who is an incredible Sudanese advocate whose voice is powerful and consistent and selfless and one of the people who I trust the most. Um, Her and I are putting together a fundraiser and we are going to be sending this money to trusted volunteers on the ground who will be buying supplies in country to provide vetted initiatives that I have come into contact with with the list of needs that they have personally handed over to us. That is one way where I feel like at least this on-ground reporting for me personally can reap some tangible support. There are other initiatives. There's Home Tax SD. Uh, There's the Sudan Solidarity Fund. Uh, These are trusted initiatives run by people who have been in this space for a long time, who've been advocating for Sudan for a long time and aren't just doing this now. But realistically, without pressure for a ceasefire, without pressure for international intervention that is actually in the interest of the vulnerable communities on the ground, this war is going to continue because this is now a matter of pride. These people, the RSF, are in people's homes. They have taken everything that people have. They have abducted girls and women from family homes and have taken them to God knows where. The end of the war is not going to bring back the people who've died and it's not going to restore people's livelihoods or homes. But it means that this doesn't continue to become entrenched every day. And that ceasefire requires action from people. It requires people to go out to protest. It requires them to raise their voices, to put pressure on their representatives, to put pressure on their governments, to at the very least donate to UN humanitarian appeals for Sudan that have been consistently underfunded. There needs to be like remedial action on a collective level where people show that they care about what's happening to Sudan, where people show that selective empathy is not going to continue to take lives. They need to see that this is untenable. My message to the people outside would be, dear friends, 
war is horrible. We've seen every, we've seen the worst sides of humanity. We've experienced it. We've seen brutality. We've seen horrors. We've seen things that words cannot describe. We've seen everything and it's getting hard and harder and harder for us to hold on, for us to keep going. We are trying our best to not fall into despair, but it's getting really hard and we don't know how much we can take anymore. Like a lot of us have reached their limits. Many Sudanese people abroad, refugees are taking away their own lives and many in Sudan too. So please help us, please raise our voices, uplift our voices. We need to get our voices to the right people who can stop this. In 2019, the mighty people of Sudan stood up for justice and they were able to remove the tyrannical Umar al-Bashir from office. With the help of Allah, the most just, inshallah, they will once again rebuild Sudan and restore power back to the people where it rightfully belongs. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam, has informed us, and I quote, You see the believers as respect to their being merciful amongst themselves, showing love among themselves and being kind, resembling one body, so that if any part of the body is not well, then the whole body shares the sleeplessness and fever with it. Our Ummah is one body, and when one part of the body feels pain, the whole body aches. Right now, Sudan is in extreme pain, and so our hearts too ache for our brothers and sisters. Our collective survival depends on each other, let us do everything we can to fight for justice and to fight for the people of Sudan. Oh Allah, protect the people of Sudan. Liberate them from their oppressors. Grant them relief from the violence they are going through. Ya Rabb, cover them in your rahmah and protection, for there is no other protector but you. Ya Rabb, bestow upon them peace and stability and grant them strength to rebuild their beautiful homeland. Allahumma ameen. Digital Sisterhood Show The Digital Sisterhood Show If you have the means, Yusra is helping to raise money for a Big Sudan fundraiser to support vulnerable communities in Umdurman, Port Sudan, and Kasala through the month of Ramadan and beyond. The donation link is in the episode description below. As you already know, I want to give a shout out to our production team for the one time, one time. I want to give a shout out to our lead producer, Hannah Allen. When I tell you, cut this episode, sister, you cut this episode as per usual. Mashallah, tabarakallah. May Allah start to accept it from you. I want to give a shout out to our incredible, extraordinary writers, Farida Barua and Maheen Khan Bashir. Beautiful writing sisters. Chef's kiss. I want to give a shout out to our sound designer, Yusuf Dawazu, our production manager, always Mihin Khan Bashir. I also want to give a shout out to our incredible extraordinary marketing and design team, Wasima Farah, Sosan Abdullahi, Khadija Musa, and Maria Sean. Thank you, ladies, very, very much. I also want to give a shout out to our cover artist, the one who read this incredible art piece, man. It should be in the Lurve. It's the Lurve, is how you pronounce it? I don't even know anymore. I want to give a shout out to our cover artist, Aya Mohammed. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Thank you, Aya, for bringing this episode to life through your art. It was beautiful. If you enjoyed this story, then donate to our Launch Good crowdfunding campaign. TDS has come a long, long way from myself, from just being in a bedroom, to 16 team members, all working together to bring these stories to life. Told with heart, worked on with so much blood, sweat, and tears. So please, consider us in your giving this Ramadan and donate to TDS at launchgood.com forward slash support TDS. That's launchgood.com forward slash S-U-P-P-O-R-T-T-D-S. 
And if you are not tired of us from listening to us and telling you stories, then let me tell you guys, we have an after show that drops every Tuesday for our Apple subscription and Patreon members. So if you're not tired, you want more, more and more content from us, this is for you. The after show is for you. And I personally love the after show because it's us unfiltered, okay? It's literally us unfiltered, unedited, really just speaking from our hearts and giving you all of the tea, the behind the scenes, the vision, the direction, the stories. I mean, you get everything on the after show, inshallah. So if you're really interested in that, definitely join our Apple subscription or our Patreon. The link is in our bio. Again, dropping every Tuesday this season. Love you guys. See you there. So I have to say, guys, we will be taking a quick mixed season pause for Eid. Okay, it's just one week. Calm down. Nobody get mad, okay? Don't even try it. So I know you'll be missing us next Friday, but enjoy your day with your families, man. Enjoy the Eid. Yawm al-Farah. May Allah start to accept all your ibadahs, your siyams, your qiyams, your sadaqah, and everything in between. Make dua for the oppressed all over the world. Don't forget them in your prayers. They need you. And set your reminders for the Friday, the 19th, when we'll be back with the remaining episodes of the season. Love you guys. And Eid Mubarak.